So our first uh, speaker is Remy Doré. Everyone can hear me? So, hello everyone, good morning. I'm uh, Rémi Doré, I'm third year PhD student. <clears throat> and uh, today I'm going to present you my work um, of my PhD thesis, uh, supervised by Emmanuel Marja in the Structural Biology Center of Montpellier in France. And I'm going to talk to you about um, how to calibrate an optical force sensor by DNA origami. So general outline, first I will beginning to talk to you about my field, mechanobiology, and how can we measure some piconewton forces on the scale of a cell. And then I will briefly introduce you to the magnificent world of DNA origami and how powerful it is. And then I will finish by uh, showing you how I'm planning to calibrate the optical force sensor by using DNA origami. So my PhD thesis is part of a wider project called DynamoLink. Um, this is a collaboration with USC in the US that we have. And in fact, the aim is to uh, study the link complex. The link complex is a bunch of proteins that make the link between the cytoskeleton and the nucleoskeleton. Um, we have several, several proteins that um, organize, oligomerize, and cluster, cluster uh, under some specific mechanical challenge. And my part, uh, on our part uh, on the project, is to build an object that can, um, that can, uh, that can feel the force that the protein is, uh, is feeling. And the goal is to insert uh, such a force sensor to the backbone of, uh, of a protein in order to have some force maps of the cell. So this object is the optical force sensor. Um, in fact, it, the idea is to, uh, to uh, traduce uh, fluorescence information into a force information. So for that, we have uh, this object that is made with two fluorescent proteins, uh, one green and one red, uh, linked by something that we call a TS mode. It's an elastic peptide that can change. And these two fluorescent proteins will interact by threat. So we have first a donor, a donor protein that will... Uh, be excited uh, uh, with his her wavelength of excitation. Then, depending on the distance to the other protein, the donor, the acceptor protein, it will transfer his energy. And afterwards, the the, the acceptor protein will re-emit uh, the energy transferred, uh, depending on the distance. So, you can imagine that if you have a system where you have the force sensor inserted on it, and you will pull on it, it will increase the distance and then decrease the threat efficiency. And so we already, uh, we already uh, succeed to insert uh, these uh, force sensor into, uh, into cells and having for now an uncorrected threat because we still need some uh, calibration. Because what is a sensor without a proper calibration? Um, there is a paper of Lacroix um, published in 2018 um, that made this simulation of, uh, of, uh, of calibration due to different, um, based on different uh, geometry and sequence of uh, the elastic peptide in between. And in fact, uh, when you have a short peptide and uh, in, in between, you have the two proteins that are very close to each other, so you have high threat. And uh, if you have a long peptide, you have a low threat. But these are simulation and no one uh, did this calibration experimentally, so this is our goal. But first, uh, let me introduce you to the, the magic world of DNA origami, so how it's, how it's working. We first have a very long uh, circular um, DNA strands, uh, single strand, um, from uh, the M13 phage plasmid. And in fact, you have a sequence that is defined. You cannot change it. What you can change is the short staples, the short DNA origami that you will add uh, on, with, on the mix, and you will bind uh, specifically uh, some, uh, some, some sequences. And with um, a temperature ramp from 60 to 40 degrees and a bit of magnesium salt, you will have self-assemble. And then, 
I have here a little animation to show you how it's working. So you have this long strand and the, the, the short staples will, uh, will, will self-assemble to it. And in fact, what is, what is defined, the geometry of the DNA origami, it's this short crossover there. You can have scaffold crossover or staple crossover that will, uh, in fact, bind some specific region to the, to the origami. So this is the basic principle. This is just a square, but we can do some uh, very various things. Um, uh, Rothman, uh, in 2006, uh, is the father of the DNA origami technique. He did 2D origami just uh, to, to, to show that it's working, some triangles, smileys. But nowadays, we're, going, we're doing some much more complex, um, complex assemble, like the various trap of the, the team of Henrik Dietz in Munich, and um, that can trap a virus with specific antigens. And uh, in our team, uh, we did a, the nano-inch. The nano-inch is, in fact, uh, aimed to apply some specific forces on mechanoreceptor on the cells, directly on the cells. So we can have some steady structure and dynamic ones. But let's get back to our purpose. Uh, I remind you that my goal is to reproduce that experimentally. So we have to get a range of force and to apply it on the force sensor. We can do it by AFM, of course, because you're, you'll be very accurate on the force applied. But the fact is uh, you will have uh, just one sensor calibrated at a time. And for threat measurements, you'll have to do some statistics to have histograms. So it's a limitation. And also, with AFM techniques, you can have fast photo bleaching that can may be complex for, for fluorescent uh, experiments. So, that's why we came up with the force clamp. The force clamp is a DNA origami. So every rods, every rods you see on the this scheme is double-stranded DNA, and the green part is single-stranded. Single-stranded in such a way that you can hybridize and bend the optical force sensor uh, to the to the force clamp. And in the N terminus and C terminus of uh, the protein, uh, you will have uh, uh, two, two different chemistry that binds single-stranded DNA to it, and then afterwards bind the, the, the DNA origami. And in such a way, you'll have plenty of them, and you can do some histograms, and uh, everyone is happy. So this is a, a zoom out of the, the structure. The, the green part is the long scaffold that I talk you about. The, the, gray, the, gray, uh, the gray short oligo are the core staples that made the structure and the rigidity, rigidity of it. The red uh, part is uh, the four staples that can control the force. I will come to that later. And the yellow part are controlling the opening and the closing of the clamp. It makes the DNA origami a uh, dynamic structure. Um, we, we've been provided the, the first version of a force clamp um, by um, uh, Tim Lidl in Munich. Uh, it was a steady structure, so uh, just to apply force on a double-stranded DNA. And uh, for us, uh, it was a bit complex because we need the opening and the closing of it. So I will explain that. So first, you fold a DNA origami with no force, uh, without any tension, in order to allow the, the, the proteins to bind to it. Afterwards, you'll add the seam staples that will bind the two parts of the, of, the, of the origami and then apply the tension. So in such a way, you'll have, uh, depending on the force applied, different threat efficiency value and uh, you'll be able, uh, hopefully, to calibrate the, the sensor. So we have clearly these two states, the relaxed state and the tension state that can bind optical force sensor, but can bind also other um, structure, uh, DNA, proteins, and things. You'll have here some EM, EM images and uh, high-speed AFM imagine, images in order to see that on, 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 on real, what what's looks like in real life. So now you may be thinking, how can I control the force of it? I told you about uh, these force staples. Um, in fact, it's kind of basic principle, if you let a lot of uh, free single-stranded bases into the, the single strand part, you'll have a low force. But if you slip the scaffold, it's like pulling on a wire. You reduce the number of nucleotides in between, then you will increase the force. Uh, these forces are uh, calculated um, with a warm light chain model in one dimension 
by minimizing the free energy of the system, uh, you'll, you'll get, a, you'll get a, an entropic force, but uh, still a force, and this will depend on the number of nucleotides in between the two, uh, in between the, in between, um, in the single standard part. So, uh, due to the, to, to, to the, to the, to the time I, I have, I will illustrate that with one uh, particular experiment. So, um, this free joint chain model is okay, it's nice, but the thing is that we wanted to check that the, 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 the force that we're modeling is the, indeed the force applying. So, we think about one experiment that can calibrate the calibrator, in fact. Having some hairpins, different hairpins, um, um, hybridized to the force clamp, and with different opening force. So the idea is to have first a binding of a hairpin with a high thread value, with the two fluorophore, two fluorophore that very close to each other, then apply the tension, and zipping the hairpin, and having a low thread value on the, on the, on the, on the, on the microscope, on the ensemble thread. So the different uh, critical forces, uh, meaning opening forces, are uh, depending on percentage of uh, GC pair. Um, if you have more GC pair, you have more hydrogen bounds. So if, depending on the percentage of it, you will have different forces. And if you will increase it, you'll have an increasing force. This is a paper from Woodside for 2008. And the idea, in fact, is to build a matrix between different force clamps applying different forces and opens different hairpins in order to confirm the model and afterwards applying the, the, the right forces on the, on, the, on the optical force sensor. So the idea is to have the force clamp uh, without tension, just with the holigo, very far from each other. So we have only low threat uh, values, low threat histograms, low threat population. Then you bind to it the, the, the hairpins that will put the two fluorophore close to each other. Then you will have the upper, uh, an operation of a high thread value, and afterwards adding the seam staples in order to pull and uh, unzip the, the, the hairpins and getting back your low uh, thread value. So, um, I don't know the time, but I think it's kind of, kind of it. So, in conclusion, um, uh, we did se several uh, designs, several optimization of the of the force clamps uh, because the origami seems to be very easy to, to to get, but in fact the dynamic structure that we we want we want to have is kind of complex to have. So we have a lot of design optimization to do, uh, but yet this uh, structure kind of uh, kind of being now uh, optimized and characterized by different different uh, imagery techniques. And uh, we'll build the matrix I, I, I talk I talk you about about different um, having different hairpins and different force clamps uh, applying different forces, and in such a way we think that by the end of the summer, we think the force sensor will be calibrated, hopefully. So with that, I would like to um, thank my uh, whole team and especially Emmanuel Marja, that is my uh, my. Um, my, my supervisor, and also uh, Gaetan Bello, that is the, the chief of the DNA origami team uh, in, uh, in our lab. So, and I would like to thank also Fabien Pinot from, uh, from US, uh, Juan Elles Garret that works on the model, Tim Lidl and Arthur Armatov for the providing of the first version of the force clamp, and also Ainer and Pauls for the, the financement. Thank you very much. Any questions? I'll, I'll, I'll first ask you your, your, your first question. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I was using uh, only uh, fluorophore for now, uh, some cyanins, holigo, just holigo labeled. Afterwards, the hairpins with uh, different, uh, different, different holigos. And uh, for now, the OFS bind to the, the force clamp, but we not pull on it yet. And the second question was? Um, 
No. Uh, for, the, for the hairpins, uh, the zipping and the unzipping is dynamic, but uh, so, so, so small that you, you cannot see the difference in the, in the, in the, in the francistograms. Yep. The distance, uh, it's uh, depending on the elastic peptide that you have in, in between. So in fact, it's repeats of glycine and serines, and you can have more repeats if you, you want to have uh, an increasing distance or not. But typically, is the order of 10th nanometer. Uh, you, might, you, you mean the piconewton range? The range or the value itself? The range, yeah, you can start from 8 and you go f uh, to 20. But you can, you can increase that, in fact. If you, as as you, you removed some, uh, we tried 60 piconewton, it's kind of the maximum. And after, after that, it's uh, very weird. Okay, so our next speaker is Tony Lemos. Hi everyone, so I'm Tony from the Kim Lab at Georgia Tech and we do single molecule physics there. And today I'll be talking one of the projects I've been working on which is producing torsionally constrained DNA via CRISPR-Cas9 nickase. And to begin, I'd like to take note that in your cells DNA are torsionally constrained, right? So there's a big interest in looking, in like looking at, uh, I mean sorry, supercoiled, so there's a big interest in looking at supercoiled DNA. And we want to actually investigate that and actually how do you actually create supercoiled DNA, right? So first you need a torsionally constrained molecule, right? So what happens is if you attach it to the surface, right, and you uh, apply a twist to one end, eventually the torsional stress will create these superstructures, plectinines, right, and we can investigate that, those dynamics there. But the necessary condition is that you need to have more than one attachment point on the surface, right? Because only, if you only have one, right, you'll have a torsionally relaxed DNA and therefore if whatever twist you put on one end, it will it will never form a supercoiled structure, right? So that's the basic idea of how do we look at supercoiled DNA in the single molecule level. So how do we traditionally do that? Well, one thing that we're going to look at doing in our lab is doing magnetic tweezers, right? So for magnetic tweezers, you need two uh, types of surface atomic points, right, where there are fog in a way, right? So where one end attaches to the surface, right, and the other end attaches to the magnetic bead, right? So then, once you twist the bead, right, you can create these supercoiled structures, right? So how do we actually create this? This is the first steps of what we're going to do, is create this modified DNA. So to do, there's three parts, right? There's the handle parts, right, the two handle parts, and there's the bare region, right? And typically, traditionally, what people have done is they create these handle parts separately, where they use a polymerase chain reaction to incorporate the surface attachment points, I mean, the modifications to the ends, and then they use cloning to engineer specific sequences what they want. Right, and typically for the ligation method, you need to have restriction enzymes, but that can limit the sequence you have in the bare region because it would cut it. And for the megaprimer method, which is more popular, uh, you would do another polymerase chain reaction to incorporate these two ends together into the cloning, but there can be a limit on the size of DNA that you have there because of the processivity of the polymerase. So our method of doing this is to create a robust method that's not limited by the sequence or length, right? So how are we going to do this? So uh, we're going to use Cas9 nickase, right? So here, we're actually going to start with our template DNA, whatever DNA size that you want here. Here we we're using lambda DNA, which is about 50 kilobase pairs long, right? And then we des design a nickase to only nick one end of the DNA, right? So this is very specific to one side of it. We nick it, and then we use a simple nick translation where we use a polymerase to displace one of the strands, and then it would incorporate one of the modifications at one end, right? So this is the first steps of it to create, incorporate one handle, right? How do we actually test that this worked? Well, we can use a simple flow assay where we use intercalating dyes to visualize DNA on the surface, right? And we flow it to see if it's actually incorporating the handle, right? And here's just a small little video here where we see on the left is our DNA stretch under flow and we kind of get the lengths of it and we kind of see the distribution of most of the molecules is where we expect, which is the, the red dashed line, which is great. So our first step works and then as you guys can guess, to do the other hand, we just do the same process where we create another uh, nickase that actually 
next the other end of it, right? So again, specifically to one end, and then we again do the same process again where we incorporate another modification at the other end, right? So we did that with that one, and we actually gonna use bees to actually say that oh, our two handles are attached, right? So one end will attach to the surface, and the other end will attach to a bead, right? And we do another simple flow assay. Or again, where we actually track the beads to kind of see, oh yes, that the handles are correctly uh, incorporated here. And here's the distribution of all the beads that are actually moving. So like, I guess we do have confidence that we are actually incorporating the two handles together, right? And the next step is actually like building the magnetic tweezers set up to actually test that these are actually torsion constrained. So with that, I guess with my time, I'd like to end and thank my advisor and my colleagues for this, for, uh, for the help. And I guess I'll take any questions. Done for the Quick question. So the, the next speaker is Raibat Sarkar. Good morning, everyone. I am Raibat. I am a second year PhD student in the Davis Lab at Yale, and I'll be talking about my work on ultrafast peptide dynamics in living cells. So, traditional protein folding studies in buffers do not take into account the complexities of the cellular environment and thus do not accurately represent how protein behaves in the cell. The cellular environment is crowded and heterogeneous, and there are various things inside the cell that can interact with our protein, which can influence its behavior. One way people have tried understanding how protein folding works in cells is through MD simulations. Simulations are great and they do provide a lot of insights. However, since there are no experimental benchmarks, these simulations cannot be validated and hence are not always accurate. There are experimental techniques like NMR and fluorescence microscopy, which also answer a lot of questions. But this in-cell experimental techniques lack the necessary spatiotemporal resolution uh, to study the ultrafast peptide dynamics. Our lab works on a microscopy technique called fast relaxation imaging microscopy, or FRI. So what FRI does is it combines fluorescence microscopy with laser-induced temperature jumps. So we essentially start with a FRET-labeled peptide or a, or a sample, and we perturb its equilibrium using a laser-induced laser temperature jump. And as the sample or protein unfolds and refolds, there's a change uh, in the FRET signal. We can monitor the FRET signal as a function of time and extract from dynamics and kinetics data out of it. These microscopes have been used for a variety of applications, including binding studies or protein dynamics in living cells. FRI is unique in the sense that it allows investigation of stability and dynamics in vitro in living cells, as well as in organisms like zebrafish and even potentially tardigrades. The systems I am working on are fast folding peptides, specifically the WW domain proteins, these proteins are ultra-fast folders, and they have been extensively studied in vitro and in silico. Uh, the name WW comes from the fact that they are characterized by two conserved tryptophan residues in the sequence. So MD simulations are expensive for large proteins, but they are doable for small fast-folding peptides. And these peptides fold in the time scale of the MD simulations that we want to emulate. Having said that, the traditional fry microscopes that we currently have are not fast enough to measure the dynamics of the WW domain proteins. They are temporarily limited by the camera. So what we are currently trying to do is make a faster microscope or increase the speed limit of our microscope. And we believe that integrating a phantom camera can help us image at a fast enough frame rate uh, that can help us understand the dynamics of these peptides. But the consequence of imaging at such a high frame rate is that we lose a lot of signal to noise. The other thing we want to incorporate is the high cat intensifier. And our preliminary data suggests that with the intensifier and the fast camera, we can not only image at a much higher frame rate, we can also detect a temperature jump. To summarize, uh, FRI can provide in vitro and in cellular information with high spatiotemporal resolution. I believe the completion of this study will provide a method for studying microsecond kinetics with high spatial resolution, and it will be a benchmark for computational studies. We are actively collaborating with the O'Hearn Lab, with Professor Corey O'Hearn at Yale, for the computational studies. And last but not the least, I would like to thank Dr. Caitlin Davis, my supervisor, my mentors, Eddie and Dr. Hage and you, and the rest of the members of the Davis Lab, and you all for your kind attention. Thank you. Okay. Are there any questions?
I had a question. Um, wondering, in the simulations, can you kind of just lower the temperature to kind of slow everything down? Or does that? Um, so I don't do the simulations. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but most, uh, I mean, you can slow everything down. And, but there are still not enough in-cell experimental data uh, on proteins in general um, to actually tell if the simulations are accurate or I mean, they can be accurate, they cannot be accurate, they may not be accurate, it depends on when you do the experiments, you can probably say more. So our next speaker is uh, Remy Cassier. Oh. Oh, okay. So then um, our next speaker is Don Lamb. Great. <clears throat> so good morning, and uh, I've, we have a couple of great introductory talks. Um, it's great to hear Fred, so I'll talk a little bit about Fred. Um, <clears throat> I know a lot of you have differential equations for breakfast, and so let me try to explain this very difficult equation, basically to say, if we look at Fred efficiency, it's a ratio of red to total fluorescence, so if we excite the green dye, we have, if they're close together, we get red light. And if they're far apart, we get green light. And by taking the ratio, we can calculate a lot of cool things. And Remy gave a nice introduction. Now, the way that we're doing the experiments, uh, one way we do it is we do it in solution. So we have here the focus of our confocal volume. We sit there and wait and wait and wait. We take a snapshot as a protein goes through. We wait again, take a snapshot as a protein goes through. And for each protein, we get a measured FRET value, and we create these uh, single molecule FRET histograms, which we'll analyze. Now, the, what we also do is we do something called pulse interleave excitation. This is based on, on the Alex method uh, developed by Shimon Weiss's lab. So we do one experiment with a pulse green laser, and then a few nanoseconds later, we pulse the red laser. That allows us to see whether we have an active red dye, uh, which gives us stoichiometry information, plus we get information over the lifetime. So we can do two-dimensional plots, for example, is stoichiometry, how much light comes after green excitation versus how much, uh, well, over the total. So donor only ends up there, acceptor ends up somewhere down here, and then you can take your only double-labeled molecules, so you know you're looking at the molecules that are labeled with two dyes. This becomes even more important when you go to three colors. So the first part of the story I'm going to tell you is about the maltose binding protein. It's, uh, it's a uh, two-domain protein, and we're looking at protein folding. So it has the, the C-terminal domain, the uh, N-terminal domain, C-terminal domain, the N-terminal domain. In this case, uh, we've played around. There's a, what's called a, 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 a folding deficient or folding um, slow folding mutant. We made two mutations, sort of messing up the hydrophobic core in the N-terminal domain. And that slows down the folding. It can still fold spontaneously, but on the order of about 13 times slower. And you can, say, and you can actually rescue this with chaperones, so it's a really nice system for looking at how chaperones work. And so we wanted to look at the folding of two domains. Most of the protein folding studies have been done in small single domain proteins. And we have three different labeling locations, so we can look at basically the conformation of the N-terminal domain, of the C-terminal domain, or the interface in between them. So this pro do, uh, protein, we can denature it, so it's stable up till about 0 0.8, 0 0.9 uh, uh, molar guanidine HCl. Then it unfolds, and there's this hysteresis region. We've measured it looking at the tryptophan fluorescence. We also do it with single molecule FRET, where we have our proteins in these respective locations. And you can see if there is a little bit of an intermediate, but you see the, the folded state, the unfolded state. When we refold, you get a, a nice intermediate. We can actually plot all of this data here on what's the waterfall plot, makes it a lot easier to understand. So you see basically it's fairly stable till you reach the high uh, 0 0.9 uh, guanidinium HCl concentration, it unfolds. And when you come back, you see this intermediate. And now I'm sure you all paid close attention. So you say, ah, with, uh, with the Fred efficiency, we can get distance. So we actually see sort of a compaction going on in this uh, rebinding. Um, and if we look at the other domains, we see the same thing, C-terminal domain and also the NC interface. You see this intermediate. It's uh, here less contrast, but we see it. 
threat is not always directly relation, uh, related to the um, distance. So sometimes nature is a little bit tricky. So in the middle of your snapshot, the protein changes on you, right? So if you have kids, I don't, but you know, you try to take a picture of them and then they, they do all these weird things, right? And so we're trying to take pictures of our proteins. And if you have a high FRET state, you know, you'll get a nice um, information. Low FRET is there, but sometimes it will try to switch in the middle of the picture. And uh, so what we do is we take the lifetime information that we have available from our experiment. So we can plot the FRET efficiency from intensity and we can plot it from the lifetime. If we plot it from the intensity, we get what's called a population weighted average. And if we look at the lifetime, well, we don't have enough photons to do it by exponential fit, so we get an average value, and it's actually a photon weighted average. And the more, if you're in the low FRET stage, you get more donor photons. So you get the shift to the right here that tells you automatically, aha, we have dynamics. And so we can see we have dynamics going on, and if we do that for these constructs, inter the internal domain is undergoing dynamic oscillations between a very compact folded state or folded like state and unfolded states. We see the same thing in the C-terminal domain and in the interface. So we have a dynamic intermediate. We can get the lifetime out because we have all these various methods that we can use. One is filtered FCS <clears throat> where we can get longer lifetime, well, we can get the fast time scales. We can also do a photon um, distribution analysis. And we can actually get then the microscopic rates going backwards and forward. And you basically see the relaxation time getting very slow when it can start to fold. It gets stuck. It, it's have a hard time. Uh, trying to find the right confirmation. And so we can actually look into the energy landscape. Um, the second thing we wanted to do was to look into the uh, folding order. So does the domain order uh, of folding remain the same? So in the wild type, the internal domain folds in about a second. The C-terminal domain needs about a minute to follow. Now we've messed up the internal domain. This folds more slowly. Does the order, is the order conserved or is the order not conserved? So here we put three dyes, and I guess this saves me a little bit from, you know, from after Dimitri's talk, saying that with two colors you can't do anything. Uh, I thought either I look for a new postdoc position or, well, but fortunately we've gone to three colors so we can look at three distances at the same protein at the same time. So we did the experiments. This is looking again at the refolding kinetics. We see the intermediate. Okay, it's a little bit more noisy, but there's actually more information in it. And so now we can say, okay, let me take fold proteins that have folded in the internal domain, and now I look for these proteins, what are their distributions here in the C-terminal domain, and we compared it to the folded state. So the folded state is here the orange. This is what we'd expect if the proteins were folded. And the distribution shows actually we have this, um, we have some that are folded, but actually quite a few of the C-terminal domain are not folded. If we look at the NC interface, that's mostly formed. We can do it the other way around. Let's look at those where the C-terminal domain has folded. So we're taking these molecules, the N-terminal domain has folded, and the interface formed. And the last one, okay, the NC interface. If that's formed, the N-terminal domain is formed, but the C-terminal domain is still looking. All right, so we can see basically if the N-terminal domain has formed, the C-terminal domain may or may not have, but when the C-terminal domain is formed, then everything's formed. So for this part of the talk, we've seen an intermediate state. It's dynamic. Uh, it's actually dynamic when bound to the, uh, to the chaperone protein, which I didn't show. Uh, we have entropic search for the actually right conformation since we messed up this hydrophobic core. It's dynamic on Groyel, which I skipped. And then we can actually look using three-color fret at the order of the domain folding. So we could see, yes, the N-terminal domain folds before the C-terminal domain. The order is preserved, even though we've messed up with folding on the one domain. Okay, so we've looked at dynamics. We're taking snapshots. Of course, a lot of times one would like to look at dynamics in maybe a longer time scale. And so you can encapsulate your protein in glass bubbles, or you can tie them directly uh, in soap bubbles, or you can... Um, Immobilize them on the surface, and you get these nice traces where you can see, you know, the proteins doing their everyday task of life. Um, we do this with turf microscopy, and we can do it either on a prism or through the objective, either one we have on our system. And so what happens? Well, let's take a three-color experiment. We first excite with green. We can look at the molecule with, uh, look at what's going on between the green and red dye. 
we can then excite the blue dyes and we do this alternatingly and then look at the three color, what's going on. The equations get a little bit more complex. You need to get three dyes on the same molecules. There's a whole other talk about how to do the three color, but what happens? You need statistics. You know, we're talking about single molecules. Single molecules are people as well. Each one's a little bit different. And so, you know, if you just have one molecule, is this really a standard molecule? So what do we do? We measure multiple movies. Maybe you get 100 to 200 molecules per movie. You do 100 movie, and you get traces, traces, and more traces. And then you have the problem that Rachel talked about on Monday that she measures, and then she has a week of analysis to do. So my students measure for an afternoon, and then they would disappear for one to two weeks to measure, uh, to try to sort out the traces. So what we've developed now is a machine learning to let the computer do this for you. So you can take your one color, two color, three color data, put it in, and the computer then basically hands you everything on a silver platter or many things. This was done, work done by uh, Simon Woninger. We call this a deep learning assisted single molecule imaging analysis. Uh, our collaborator partner, Philip Tinefeld, uh, and Johan Bolin did, provided the, the origami, and we affectionately call this deep lazy. So the idea is we take our traces, we put them into a trace classifier. Now, we're not the first ones to try to do machine learning on FRET traces, and actually there was deep FRET from uh, Nikos Hatsaki's lab in Copenhagen, and we actually tried to use it. We liked it. Um, it only works for two color. And, uh, but then we decided to, to work a little bit on his own. But he started the idea of you, what you do is you do not just good and bad, but you actually do the good, bad, and ugly. So you go through, you put the traces, and then the computer will look at this and tell you, okay, I think the tra trace is static or it's dynamic. I can, you know, we keep it. And there's a lot of other things. It can be, you know, aggregates where you have more than one molecule in the spot, or you can have molecules in the back, background, the trace can be extremely noisy, uh, and so we separate those. We also analyze every frame which fluorophores are on and which ones are off. As Remy has told you earlier, you need these calibration factors, and sometimes you can use parts of the traces where you have, for example, the donor blinking or the acceptor photo bleach to get correction factors. So every frame is then also with the photo bleaching characterized, so we get basically our traces out, then we can take the dynamic traces and put them into a second series of neural networks. And the first, you can either have one that tells you how many states it finds, and then it will go through and do a state classifier Well, it will go through the trace and find the states for you. It will also take the regions of the trace that are useful for correction factors and determine them separately. And then it will go through, digitalize your traces, say, ah, okay, here we have state one, state two, or my confidence level of having state one, state two, state one, state two. Again, for one, two, or three color data. And this, you get a tr transition density plot where you say, okay, I start with a FRET value, where do I go? And at this point, that's when you first can start playing with it. Actually, you can play any part of this you can do manually, or you can have it all done inter uh, interactively by pushing the mag magic button, and this takes you now about 50 milliseconds per trace. I think we're down to about 20 milliseconds per trace. Does it really work? How good does it work? Well, we first tested it with simulated data, and if we look at the photo bleach state, that works extremely well, so it knows which dyes are on and which dyes are not on. If we look here at really the good states, the good traces from the bad and the ugly, if we sum them together, we're at some like somewhere around 97% of the traces are good. You don't want to be too perfect, because if you train the algorithm black and white, and then you give it real world, real world problems, it, does, it has problems with that. The big problem, I guess, is sometimes between a static and a noisy trace. There, I guess, I guess we have a little bit of a problem. But, I mean, we're still over, well over 90% accurate. Experimentally, okay, this is all simulated data and data that, uh, you know, so we took data it didn't see in this, that simulated the same way, it does a good job. What about experimental data? So we have this DNA origami. We have here a tether that can fluctuate between two binding sites. We have a die so we can do single pair fret. And I guess in gray we have deep lazy, in blue we have manual selection. So if we look at the raw traces, uh, 
what's selected is pretty much identical. If we do the correction, there's actually, for the high fret state, the same value for the low fret state. There's a little bit of a difference, and that's due to the correction factors and how many uh, actual, um, how much data you have for determining the correction factors where deep lazy may actually have a little bit of an advantage. If you look at what we want to get out of this, you have, you know, the fret states, you have the lifetimes, both of those are the same, independent of whether the computer analyzes this or people analyze this. What was interesting, I had two of my people analyze it. One, being the experienced postdoc and knowing how valuable statistics was, tried to get as any part of the trace she could find that could do something, so she found about 1,700 traces. The second student was a perfectionist, and so she only took the best traces, so had a very high overlap between everybody else. Deep Lazy was somewhere in between. And if I actually compare three different trained networks, they're much more consistent than my students. Um, so, <coughs> good. So now we can do it. We can do it also with three color. Here's a three color model. Um, so we have fret efficiency between blue, green, and red. We get the dynamics going on. We get three different fret states going on. Uh, good, the algorithm says, oh, I think this is a dynamic trace. Oh, red is photobleached here, red and yellow is photobleached, all dyes is photobleached. And then the trace is digitalized into state one, state two, state one, state two. And you can adjust these parameters by giving a confidence level. Uh, so we nicely can select out the two states. We get here our uh, proximity ratio in gray. That's uncorrected. If you actually look, both blue and red are on the origami. There should be no change in fret efficiency. They're static. Um, but you see two states, but that's because of the complications of three-color fret. You correct it, and it nicely collapsed to a single state. Now, this actually opens up a whole world of things that one can think about doing. When I first started doing single molecule experiments, um, uh, I was collaborating with a biochemist, and, and uh, he also said, well, you could do this, and you can do this, and this, and I was like, wait, wait, wait. Every experiment you are talking about will take a month of my students' time. If you can do this on a gel in half an hour, do it on a gel. But now we can start thinking about doing titration experiments. So here we measured the, the rate of the clock with glycerol, and we could look at the change. Each one of these two you know, pairs of data points would take a week of analysis, analysis time, and now we can do that in minutes. We've measured protein samples. We actually went to, back to old data where we actually had proteins in the um, in, in uh, vesicles where we can't add oxygen scavengers. The data quality is less than origami. We can get the same results out, and uh, we could see the same rates of unfolding, folding, and we could see the ATP dependence, which is what we published earlier. So thankfully, we got the same results. Then we went to Phillips Lab, took data that had been measured on a confocal microscope. Uh, we didn't have to retrain our data set, and uh, we could get the same data. At some point, if we go to a very, very fast clock, um, the dynamics gets a little bit too fast. Unlike maximum entropy method, where that would sort of not converge and die, uh, it does its best guess. It just tells you it's not very confident about it, and we could get the rates out. Good. The software is published. It's available, um, so you're welcome to use it. I would think it would be great. Um, so what happens, we have a full automated analysis for one, two, three color uh, data, and it's not really limited to FRET data. It's any intensity trace data. We minimize human bias. There's no hidden Markov modeling, so we don't have to worry about the fact if uh, the processes are no longer Mar Markovian. Um, so you don't need to know how many states you have to begin with. The analysis uh, is, you know, is independent of data type, more or less. Analysis then goes from days to minutes, so my students have time to do other things. So with that, thank you for your attention. I thank my group, and I'm happy to take questions. I mean, you can do the equations, right? So, but, so what you have to do, first of all, you need to, you have to have this alternating excitation because you have to do the two color, green, red, independently of the three color. So you, you have three ratiometric equations, three detectors, that's why you have to extra get the green, red. Um, so we excite with the green dye, we get the green, red. Then we get, you know, for blue, red, or blue, green, you have to correct for the fact that some of the green 
goes into the red channel. So you have, you have to know the efficiency of green red, you correct for that, and for blue red, you have to also correct for the fact that some is go leaking from green into the red. So you put it into the equations. Um, also for the analysis, what we've learned is that the best way of doing this because of all the noise you add, do it in proximity ratio and put all the corrections in the analysis. But you know, it, the distributions get broader, but having the additional piece of information is, makes it much more robust. And so you realize you need extra distributions that you couldn't do otherwise. How close? I mean, I think when I start, when we start getting thread efficiencies above 90%, then you have dye sticking, dye interactions. So I try to keep them, you know, you know, let's say uh, two nanometers or further apart. There are some nice work from, from Tim Craig's where they're looking at the overlap, you get some quenching where you can actually look at closer interactions or you can do PET, um, photon induced electron transfer, uh, to look at very, very short ranges. But uh, if you want to do structural things, I mean, the dyes are sticky, and if you get them too close, they will hug each other. Um, and, but, but what we often see is that it's actually transient. So we'll see they, they come together, they form this high fret state, then they'll, unfold, they'll let it go, and then we can treat the rest of the states normally. Right. We weren't the first ones to do that, no. I, well, my proposal to do that just got shot down. No, they thought nobody is, it's not interesting. But um, the, I haven't found a student gullible enough to try that yet. Um, <laughs> there, I think, I mean, there are really a lot of four color experiments that I think would be really interesting. And you can do, you know, there's one experiment I'd like to do with GROEL, for example, where you put one dye pair on the upper ring and one on the lower ring. And so it's two single pair frets, two pair single, pair, you know, single pair fret experiments. Those should be easy. Doing the full blown six color, uh, six distance, four colors. Um, theoretically, we've tested it with simulation. One should be able to do it. Um, how robust it is in the end, I don't know. I would like to try, but I think for that, what I wanted to do was double the number of photons by adding an additional objective, but that wasn't sexy enough, so. Nothing about the protein, protein folding? Okay, then, thank you. Next speaker is Marina Mukina. Hello everyone, thank you very much to the organizers for the great conference. So, um, I've just started my lab at the University of Sydney, uh, but today we'll be talking mostly about my postdoctoral work that was done in the lab of Nancy Kleckner at Harvard University. Um, so, the bigger question that inspires my work is how the production, sensing, and transduction of mechanical forces at the molecular level relates to the global mechanics of uh, chromosomes. And these effects are difficult to study because they start as a subtle conformational change in biomolecules and produce rapid and distant changes. And so, we need new tools to. Um, be able to extract mechanical contribution uh, from a manifold of cellular operations with different energy sources. And today I will tell you about two in situ force nanoprobes which I've developed to quantify and visualize micron scale force fields in living cells with a nanoscale precision and without disrupting the system. So uh, we are interested in chromatin. 
uh, large hierarchically organized molecules that contain all genomic DNA and DNA binding proteins. And this work is motivated by the hypothesis that forces and strains spreading in chromatin can serve as a separate biochemistry agnostic channel of chromosomal communication. And on the uh, scale of the whole genome, um, forces and associated strains and torques can form multi-micron energetic patterns uh, in this mechanically highly nonlinear pre-stressed meshwork of chromatin, uh, that those facilitating spatially and temporally coherent changes, uh, changes in structure <coughs> of chromatin, which are essential, oops, are essential for many genetic functions. Okay, so yeah, so this movie illustrates the drastic structural changes which genome undergoes during the cell division, and very importantly, these changes are correlated in time and space, and they require communication within the genome on the scales from nanometers to microns. And so we propose that mechanotransduction can be the mechanism underlying um, this special temporal coherency specifically due to its very high rates. For example, uh, diffusion of ions and molecular motor base translocation both have similar rates of few micrometers per second. And compared to this, mechanotransduction is basically transient. And uh, in the work that I'm about to introduce, we used conventional fluorescent microscopy, so we couldn't document uh, the mechanotransduction in action. Nonetheless, we were able to provide the, uh, we were able to observe the direct functional output of mechanotransduction in chromosomes. Um, so we looked at the uh, protein axis holding together two copies of chromosomes in the preparation for cell division. And we found that these axes aren't straight and instead contain these micron scale spatial patterns called helical perversions. So these patterns represent a sequential arrays of partial helices, which do not make a full turn, but instead change handedness to go abruptly in the opposite directions. And uh, these patterns are found in very different systems, including uh, Darwin's tendrils, chicken gut, uh, and differentially strained bilayer elastic strips. And for these systems, it's been known for a long time that formation of perversions require global mechanical communication in the system. And at the same time, we uh, do not know the mechanism for the uh, formation of perversions in chromatin, we would need to be able to measure mechanics of chromatin for this. But we do know that uh, these patterns disappear after the splitting of the chromosome axis. So we want to um, elucidate this mechanism of mechanical patterning in chromatin. And for this, um, I envision attaching nanoscale uh, probes to the chromatin globally to form a stress-active meshwork that responds to the local changes in pressure by emission of light, and when stress is transmitted through such meshwork, the 
activated nodes light up and we can build four-dimensional map of intracellular forces. So with this picture in mind, I would like to introduce two force nanoprobes which I'm developing uh, for intranuclear force sensing. Both nanoprobes produce optical readout, but through very different physical mechanisms. In the first case, we're using mechanoluminescence, that is emission of light in response to the mechanical deformation. In this approach, uh, we produce direct readout in which force equals photons. And this approach doesn't need photo excitation, so it's free from autofluorescent background and phototoxicity. And the second approach is it utilizes the dynamic DNA nanostructure, which changes color of photoexcited luminescence in response to the applied force. So I will begin with the first approach. Um, so at the core of this idea is mechanoluminescence, emission of light triggered by mechanical deformation. So in most cases, we need to break material in order to produce light. However, there are a few examples of materials which start emitting already under the reversible elastic deformation, and zinc sulfide doped with manganese is one of such materials. So in this movie, I slightly press on, barely touch the powder of this material, and you can see that I'm producing repeatable, very bright pulses of light, which can be seen by the bare eye under the room lights. And in my experiments, I have shown that the threshold pressure for this effect is 230 kilopascals, or less than picanewton per nanometer squared. And since intracellular forces are also within the picanewton range, in principle, it implies that this material can be used for intracellular force sensing. So I decided to explore this possibility, and my first challenge was to understand the mechanism of this effect. So I started working with these micron scale particles, which are way too big to be used inside the cells, but it was the only form of this material available at the time. And so I designed this custom microscopic setup, which allows me to apply a low pressure to a single microparticle and simultaneously detect two-dimensional patterns of mechanoluminescence. And so I used this setup to uh, record a single pulse uh, of mechanoluminescence uh, from these microparticles. And you barely can see this, so you have to believe me that uh, this experiment revealed that mechanoluminescence often emitted in these heterogeneous striated spatial patterns uh, which resemble striations in the SAM images of, the, of these particles and they are typical for the presence of stacking faults. So I wanted to explore this idea that mechanoluminescence in this material can originate at, the, at these structural defects which we see. And so um, together with my collaborators, we cut out a thin slice from this particle and we looked at it under the TM microscope. And we found that images pretty much every, of pretty much every particle contain these multiple horizontal variations in contrast, which are uh, characteristic for the presence of structural defect called stacking fault, uh, which is created when a crystal spontaneously during the growth switches between hexagonal and cubic crystal faces. <coughs> So um, based on this data and some additional structural characterization, I proposed the nanoscale model for uh, mechanoluminescence in faulted zinc sulfide. And I don't have time to go into the details of this model, but I will say that according to the model, the excitation source for mechanoluminescence <coughs> are electrons and holes which are trapped at the interfaces of the stacking fault uh, due to the presence of built-in electric fields. But the most important feature of this mechanism for my purposes 
is that the size of its uh, structural unit, a second fold, can be as small as 11 nanometers according to our TM data. And so in principle, it implies that we can use this material <coughs> Uh, that, I'm sorry, that nanocrystals with the stacking folds uh, can be expected to produce mechanoluminescence. Um, so to test this prediction, we, uh, in collaboration with a group of uh, Raymond Shag in Penn State, we synthesized these uh, nanorods with the stacking folds using this material. And again, skipping a lot of details, I will jump to the experiment in which we used correlative IFM and optical microscopy to uh, measure mechanoluminescence from a single nanorod. And I was thrilled to see that uh, multiple force cycles <coughs> applied to the same single uh, nanorod with the IFM tip produce repetitive mechanoluminescent response. And, uh, IFM images before and after force application show that particles remain intact. And so now we finally can safely say that we have mechanoluminescent nanoprobes small enough to be used in living cells. And uh, I switch to the second approach. Um, okay. Okay, good. Um, so yes, I will switch to the second approach, uh, which uses dynamic DNA origami, uh, which um, so I will switch to the second approach, which uses dynamic DNA origami, which comprises two barrels. Barrels. So uh, DNA <laughs> comprises two barrels connected by six flexible linkers, and one of the linkers has a fluorescent dye placed in a close proximity to a quincher, so when the structure is closed, the dye is quenched, and when it's forced into the open state, this short sequence fixing the dye in place is peeled off, it, and it goes away from the quincher and lights up. And also structures have red fluorescent dyes as a control, and the cumulative color of photoexcited luminescence in the closed state is red, and it turns yellow when the structure is closed. I'm sorry, when it's open. And then the energy difference between closed and open state is defined by this uh, short sequence by the length of this short sequence, and it can be said to be as low as 1.6 kT or 0.4 piconewtons applied over roughly 20 nanometers. And uh, I have time only to showcase one experiment using this nanoprobe. So in this experiment, we tested um, in vivo performance of the probe, and we for this, we incubated cells with a thymidine analog carrying a uh, click active alkyne group, and then we injected the nanoprobes to the interface nucleus of the cell. And uh, we clicked, so to click the nanoprobes to the alkyne plated chromatin. And uh, the goal here was to create the conditions for uh, in situ force sensing in uh, chromatin. So this image shows photoluminescence of these nanoprobes inside the nucleus of the living cell. And uh, we can zoom in to the single nanoprobe and we can see that uh, the nanoprobe inside the nucleus attached to the chromatin switches uh, between open and closed state. And again, I remind you that closed state uh, refers to the applied compressive force to the probe. 
So we measuring force with this uh, nanoprobe in the nucleus, and then we can build the three-dimensional tracks of the readouts of the probes of both dyes, and thus uh, it brings us to the in situ force mapping in the chromatin of a living cell. And in conclusion, um, I wanted to reiterate that both nanoprobes are give you an instrument for in situ quantitative mapping of global infracellular force uh, patterns. And uh, I wanted to emphasize that these probes are not genetically encoded, and as such, they do not uh, require genetical modification, and they are intended to be uh, generally applicable with the potential targets, including chromosomes, cytoskeleton, contractile apparatus, and uh, since there is no genetic modification, they can be applied in clinical samples and can be used for pathological conditions such as invasions of cancerous cells. Or another interesting target is physiological conditions under chronic mechanical deformations such as those existing in cardiomyocytes. And with this, I'm at the end of my talk. Um, I want to thank, of course, Klefner Lab at Harvard and CNS, my collaborators at CNS, Harvard, Alvis Addison, and Shah groups. And last but not least, I wanted to advertise postdoc position in my new lab at UMD Physics. Come join us to do science at the interface of microscopy, material science, nanobiotechnology, mechanics, <coughs> biology, signal processing. Um, thank you for your attention. So the hope is to use this but also this mechanism that is beautiful it this so there is other model that says that mitotic chromosomes are compacted as a helical staircase but then at so they would, wouldn't go apart in that model, they would be intertwined. And this model itself is so they are not intertwined, so they can be split with the layers that someone needs to do. But we didn't study two the problem. <laughs> so our next speaker is Sucho Shin.
Hello, everyone. Um, I'm a postdoc um, from UT Austin working with Professor Dave Dermalai. Um, I'm supposed to um, talk about something else, but I switch it to the, um, this topic, um, which could be uh, fitted with the, the, theme, the session theme of the single molecule. Um, so I'm going to talk about the chromosome organization. So since the um, late, um, late uh, 19th century, when um, uh, Walter Fleming um, discovered, first discovered the thread-like object um, in the cell nucleus, our understanding of chromosome organization um, has been developing quite slowly um, until um, the advanced experiment techniques um, emerged um, only very recently. So there are two standard, um, these days, two standard um, experiment methods that give uh, rich information about the chromosome organization. One is the, um, the HI-C, um, which is the um, genome-wide uh, chromosome confirmation capture experiment that reports on the, um, the, the contact frequencies of all the genomic locus um, in the cell nucleus of a given species. Um, using the, um, the high throughput uh, the sequence uh, method. The other one um, directly reports on the, um, the 3D coordinates of um, individual chromosomes um, using the super resolution imaging methods um, such that it can um, resolve the structure heterogeneity of a chromosome in the cell nucleus. Um, so these two methods um, can provide a huge amount of information but uh, we don't have the, um, we don't know about the mechanistic principle or um, the dynamics of, of for the um, chromosome, uh, which is, uh, which is, yeah, the key information to understand the functional properties of genome. So to see, yeah, to better see what's happening um, underneath of the folded chromosome, the physicists come up with the, um, the polymer-based uh, uh, polymer models. Um, one representative class of um, such models um, uses the, um, involves the interactions between the, um, the chromosome locus mediated by the um, binders, which mimic, which mimic the, um, the binding process of the um, protein factors onto DNA. I mean, in the other, in the other model, um, these interactions are put in an implicit way um, so that um, the, um, the model becomes a kind of a, um, the chromosome becomes now a self-interacting um, heteropolymer um, chain. Um, well, these models are good um, in capturing the specific organizational details, um, whereas um, they, uh, it is necessary to parameterize the energy function um, somehow. Then how the model parameters are determined. Um, so typically, um, these parameters are uh, tuned um, through an iterated process to fit the, uh, fit the simulated contact map with the high C data, um, which, is, um, which is often computationally um, pretty expensive, um, as well as um, um, physically intuitive if there are um, too many uh, parameters. So we can ask to ourselves, um, can we do a better job in getting um, those um, interaction parameters purely based on the physical concepts um, without any um, iterative um, procedure or um, fitting, yeah, fitting process? So we try to, yeah, um, we try to utilizing the old concept of uh, statistical potential, which was first introduced in the context of the protein folding. Um, almost 50 years ago from now. Um, the idea is that um, the contact um, free energy for the specific um, amino acid residue in the protein um, is determined by taking the log, um, the log ratio of the, um, the native contact observed in the, observed in, observed in the, um, the crystal, structure, yeah, crystal structure data um, of the folded proteins. Um, relative to the, um, the context you would expect um, in the reference system, uh, which is usually given with some physical um, the constraints. Um, these concepts of um, statistical potentials were, um, the applications of it uh, were successful in uh, protein folding. I mean, the, um, the thermodynamics and kinetics of protein folding and protein ligand binding as well as RNA folding. 
Uh, we expanded this idea to the, um, the folded chromosome. Um, now we are um, using the, um, the high seek contact as the input um, to here. Um, and for a, single, for a single chromosome, we can take the, um, the ideal polymer chain as a reference system because the, um, the chromosome can be regarded as a gigantic polymer. Um, and the, um, yeah, the polymer simulations, taking the inferred um, energy scales as the input parameters, um, yeah, generate the structure ensembles that is in good agreement with the, um, the experiment. And also we can, we can also, um, similarly we can expand to the, um, expand to the, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, to the, the whole, whole genome um, to get the, um, the special arrangement of the chromosomes in it, um, which is also, um, yeah, we, yeah, which also works pretty, pretty well. So without saying uh, much details, um, I hope that you also find um, this type of um, theoretical concept is pretty um, simple but useful. Um, you can get more details from our paper. And let me take another 30 seconds to um, advertise the, um, the next APS meeting. I have been organizing the, um, the genome session um, in the APS meeting. I really encourage um, junior um, people to um, attend the meeting because you are given a chance if you submit an abstract. Um, so please think about that, and especially for international um, the speaker, international uh, attendants are encouraged to come, and there will be a chance to get um, the travel grant. Yeah, we are welcome, you know, eat. Yeah, both the experimentalists and theoreticians. Okay, that's it. Thank you. So our next speaker is George Wayans. Um, you can ask questions uh, at the coffee break. I'm George. Uh, I'm working with Bolwit for that CTPB Northeastern. So uh, actually, I'm happy that I can write the date like this, day, month, and year. Anyway, so uh, what we care about is confining the effects of ions on uh, biomolecules. So we know that the RNA is negatively charged, which means that most of ions are so important in maintaining the structure and function. So we actually uh, still need to quantify some important questions like identifying the interaction mode between uh, such ions, like for example at the MG since it's like the most abundant and important one there. So there are two main modes there. Uh, one of them is uh, the one we see on this. Okay, cool, yeah. When the uh, ion is partially dehydrated so it interacts uh, in close proximity like uh, direct interaction with the uh, phosphate group of the RNA uh, so this is called inner shell. However, when uh, the ion is totally hydrated, so the interaction is happening uh, mediated by the water. So this is called outer shell. So this is one thing we need to identify. The second thing is like actual, uh, quantify the actual effect of ionic environment on large scale rearrangement, uh, especially like on big systems like the uh, ribosomes and any RNA uh, system. Uh, and also since in the uh, experimental structure there are actually a lot of misidentification for the positions of the ions, we need to identify this and be sure about these positions. So what to, to do this, uh, we are doing MD simulations, so we use structure-based model with electrostatics and the effective potential for solvation chills, which is uh, this uh, term here, where we are, uh, we're modeling the uh, solvation chills with uh, these Gaussians. And uh, to parameterize this model, we used um, explicit solving simulation to uh, get parameterization for the outer shell. However, since the inner shell is actually a very long-lived state, uh, we used some experimental results for the binding affinity to, uh, to identify the uh, depth of the inner shell and the dissociation rate, uh, I mean dissociation time for the, uh, to uh, quantify the barrier itself between inner shell and outer shell. So, yeah, so this is what we did, and after this, we applied this on two main systems, which are 58 mir and Nero switch. They are two small RNAs to, like, as a benchmark. We have here uh, this model, the last one in Bink, uh, and we found that 
uh, okay, yeah, we calculate something that's called the differential interaction coefficient, which is uh, describes the excess number of Mg ions accumulate around the RNA itself. Uh, and we found that the uh, simulations gave us uh, good results. And also there is uh, a specific uh, position that uh, Dreber uh, worked on at some point, uh, very early southerns, like uh, in, in the 58 mirror. And we also got uh, high probability for this inertial interaction between uh, between the MGI and the RNA, so this means also that like, uh, the model is able to get the positions to good extent. Uh, actually, the, the probability was of 98%, so this is uh, great. <laughs> uh, and we here are also comparing with the experiment and other models, and like we got a good agreement. After this, we applied the model on the ribosome. This is like ongoing work, so uh, I have just here uh, number of ions uh, for the uh, bacterial ribosome, yes, at the region at the region that's called accommodation corridor, where the tRNA uh, accommodates, like this, this corridor is from helices 89 to 92. This region controls the accommodation of tRNA into, uh, into the ribosome itself. And we found uh, different like we, this is what we got for number of ions for either outer shell or inner shell interactions. And what we're working on now is like trying to identify any critical uh, residues there that actually might control the energetics of uh, this substep, which is the accommodation. And also uh, we are working on different other um, uh, elongation substeps like the subunit rotation, since the, like, the subunit rotation is like to so those who are familiar with uh, the ribosome, there is small subunit and large subunit, and like, so there is rotation there, so this means like, at this interface, some people, like some scientists claim that there are a lot of ions, some claim that there is no inter, uh, there aren't a lot of inter communication there between like the ions, so this, this is also something that we need to quantify. Uh, yeah, and this is for now, so thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our last speaker is Alyssa Muller. everybody, can you hear me? Oh, still there? Okay. Um, my name is Alyssa Moeller. I'm a PhD student at University of Maryland with a joint position over at NIH. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about a uh, bacterial mechanosensitive channel called MISCES. Um, so mechanosensation, which is the ability to sense environmental mechanical stimuli, uh, is highly conserved. These mechanosensitive channels can gate in response to linear force, uh, 2D tension, membrane curvature, volume change, or shear stress. Hopefully you guys can see my pointer. Awesome. Um, they're responsible for several essential functions uh, in eukaryotes, including touch, hearing, proprioception, pain, muscle stretch, blood pressure sensing, and temperature sensing. And in general, these mechanosensitive channels are necessary for all organisms to adapt to both their internal and external environments. Uh, like I said, my focus is on the SCES, which is a bacterial mechanosensitive channel, and this channel opens in response to water influx um, during external osmolarity changes. And the efflux through these channels uh, reduces the osmotic gradient and prevents cell lysis. Um, this is an example of gating in response to 2D membrane tension, so the work is the product of the tension and the delta area associated with opening. Uh, these channels improve osmotic fitness. Uh, they enable pathogens to colonize osmotically challenging host environments and survive transmission through fresh water, causing outbreaks. And they've also been implicated in uh, antibiotic resistance, so both decreasing the efficacy of some uh, membrane-targeting antimicrobials and also increasing the sensitivities to other antibiotic classes. So they can be attractive drug targets as well. 
Um, so due to their relevance to human health and disease, and also their extension to general mechanosensitive channel gating models, both structural and functional characterizations of these channels is really important. Uh, there's a bunch of structures of muscats that have been published uh, since the original crystal, and the really remarkable thing is how sensitive it is to its lipid environment. Um, if you take a purified protein in a detergent like DDM, um, and then add lipids back into that preparation, you get a massive rearrangement of these transmembrane helices. Uh, here it is in more of a cartoon depiction rather than uh, the electron density map so that you can really see how much those transmembrane helices rearrange. And again, that's just by adding lipids back into that purified protein. Um, a similar pair of structures has also been observed in nanodisks based on the length of the lipid acyl chains. And there's a bunch of examples of these two overarching structural categories. Um, and they overlay really, really closely with the two original crystals. So we have the original non-conductive crystal and then the crystal structure of this A106V mutation, which is conductive. Um, but the goal of any of these structural studies should be to link it back to function. So we want to assign these structures a place within the MISGES gating cycle. So MISGES has three functional states, um, so open, closed and inactivated. Um, the latter two are non-conductive. Uh, the inactivated state is non-conductive and tension insensitive, but the closed state uh, is non-conductive but can be readily opened in response to uh, increased membrane tension. The channel can transition between uh, closed to open or closed to inactivated, but it can't go between uh, open and inactivated without first passing through the closed state. Um, and remember, we have two structural categories that we see, but we have three functional states. Um, so a really central question in the field has been assigning uh, the non-conductive structure to either the closed or the inactivated state. Um, the way we understand these states is by looking at the transitions between them using bacterial patch clamp electrophysiology, and this is done in native uh, E. coli membranes. Um, and it's one of the main reasons this channel is such a good model system. Uh, the way that it works is you knock out the native mechanosensitive channels on the chromosome, uh, and then you re-express the, ch uh, the channel that you're interested in on a plasmid, treat the bacteria with drugs to keep them from dividing, so you get these nice long snakes here, and then you very carefully lyse just the outer membrane, so that the inner membrane collapses into a giant sphere. You can pick it up with a little glass pipette, uh, knock off the remainder of that membrane, and then record the channel activity from that little lipid patch at the tip of the pipette. So as you apply pressure, um, you can see these are single channels opening in response to that pressure at both positive voltage and negative voltage. Um, and here you can see protocols that look at uh, the whole channel population, opening, closing, inactivation, and recovery. Um, to look at opening, you apply a ramping pressure until the channels plateau. Um, and then you open that full population of channels and then drop the pressure and then you can look at the tension dependent closing rate. Um, and in, to look at inactivation, you add little test pulses here that should reopen that full channel population and any of the channels that no longer have the ability to open uh, have transitioned into the inactivated state during this closing process. Um, and then to look at recovery, you just uh, include a zero pressure test pulse, uh, zero pressure step between your test pulses, and then you can look at the, t uh, fit this to a mono exponential and look at the tau of that recovery. Um, each of these gating transitions has its own tension sensitivity, uh, delta area, um, and kinetics, and it's important to note that the opening and closing is much faster than inactivation and recovery. Um, so then, going back to how we get our structures. So during a standard membrane protein purification, the lipids are removed. This is most commonly done with detergents, but these are a pretty poor mimic for the lipid bilayer environment. Um, they can cause denaturation uh, of your protein and definitely can cause structural changes as well. Um, but if your protein can withstand the detergent solubilization, you can reintroduce these lipids in multiple ways. Uh, very commonly, you see mixed micelles, liposomes, and synthetic nanodisks. Um, a more, but it's really important to know that the uh, detergent uh, solubilization was a prerequisite step for all of these three preparations. Um, 
A more recent approach is to use polymers to extract membrane proteins directly out of the lipid bilayer. So this gets rid of that detergent solubilization. Um, and based on the sensitivity of MESCES to its surrounding environment, uh, we thought it would be valuable to try to get a native nanodisc structure. So I used a polymer called glycodibma um, to solve the structure in native nanodisks. So it's recombinantly overexpressed, 6-his tagged, purified uh, by cobalt affinity chromatography. Um, and here I'm showing, this is the chemical structure of glycodibma, and this is the SDS in the Western. So it's relatively pure, and the Western confirms its identity. Um, and the next step was negative staining EM. Um, so you can see that the sample's a little bit heterogeneous, but we can see nice single particles as well as these larger membrane patches. And then if you go to um, 2D classification, so do a little data collection, you can see um, a sketch like 2D classes. So that was really, really exciting because this polymer hasn't been used before. Um, so the next thing that we did was uh, cryo-EM. So just briefly, the very standard grid preparation. Um, so flash freeze your purified protein in vitreous ice, and then uh, collect some micrographs, uh, motion correction, CTF estimation. Um, you pick out your particles from here, and then you uh, organize them into 2D class averages, and then you can take the selected particle stacks and build ab initio uh, reconstructions and then do multiple rounds of refinement. Um, and eventually I got to a structure that was around three angstroms. Um, so here is the resulting structure in the native nanodisks. In the cytoplasmic domain, the resolution got quite high, around 2.5. Um, so I could easily build a model in here using flexible fitting. Um, and here you can see the model inside the density and everything is colored by chain. Um, so the next thing we wanted to know is how this structure compared with those previously published structural categories. Um, so in purple here, this is the newly solved structure in glycodipma in comparison with the synthetic nanodisks uh, in full length lipids. Uh, this was the most similar structure. The RMSD is about 0.9 angstroms. And it's also very similar to the mixed micelle structure. Um, it's very, very different, unsurprisingly, from both uh, the detergent structure um, and the short chain uh, nanodisc structure. Um, so zooming in on just the short chain nanodisc structure, I'm gonna show you a morph between those two structures so that you can see those helices rearrange. Um, so that's just an artificial morph between my structure to the short chain lipid nanodisc structure. Um, and then a similar rearrangement is also seen for uh, the, between the detergent structure and my structure as well. The overall RMSD is about 9.6 angstroms. Um, really excitingly, there were additional densities in this map um, that were not accounted for by the model protein, and some of these could be modeled as lipids. Um, so this is where the lipids sit in respect to the map, and it's very, very similar to the previously reported locations uh, of detergents. Um, and then zooming into lipid one, we can see it sitting up here in between the transmembrane helices. Um, and this location has been reported uh, quite commonly um, in the synthetic nanodisc structures and in the mixed micelle structure. Um, zooming into lipids two to four, those are the ones down here at the bottom, they're in distinctly non bilayer positions. So they're like going in sideways toward the protein. Um, and Lipid four is similar to a previously observed lipid in one structure. Um, and then lipid three is close by to uh, another lipid that was observed in that same nanodisc structure. Um, but it doesn't overlay quite as well. And then lipid two is newly reported in our structure. Um, so we went ahead and modeled these lipids as POPE because we didn't see any enrichment of a specific lipid type in our mass spec. Um, and here I'm showing all four of our uh, lipids inside their electron density. And you can see that um, the head groups of these lipids are coordinated by a handful of charged residues. So we've got R88, uh, D67, R59, and K60. Um, and we also did some MD simulations, and we see that these lipids form a really dynamic H-bond network. Um, with multiple interactions, making them very, very stable due to that multiple, uh, the multitude of conf configurations. Um, we wanted to understand how these lipids impact gating. So the next thing we did was we introduced mutations um, to some of these charged lipid coordinating residues. Um, this is a little bit of an overwhelming slide, but this is the patch clamp data. So this is again looking at the inactivation recovery protocol that I showed you at the beginning. Um, and the important thing to note 
is that for the th uh, residues that are coordinating the bottom three lipids, so lipids two, three, and four, um, you see changes in uh, both the depth of inactivation and the rate of inactivation as I introduce these mutations. Um, so this is suggesting that these lipids have some role to play in the inactivation and recovery process and that they could be rearranged during that transition because I'm changing the affinity of the lipids to those binding sites. Um, it's important to note that, the, again, the time scale of inactivation and recovery is slow enough that lipid rearrangement is possible, um, whereas for opening and closing, that rearrangement is uh, not possible due to the time. Um, so based on this, we're thinking that our uh, native nanodisc structure uh, is most likely in the inactivated state with the um, tension sensing helices decoupled from the pore lining helix that has the gate and that gap is then filled in by these lipids. Um, so this is a new lipid mediated mechanism of inactivation. Um, so in conclusion, we solved a three angstrom structure of MISCES in native nanodisks extracted with a new polymer called glycodibma. Um, and this eliminates the detergent solubilization that uh, we've seen for all the previous structures. And this could be very applicable to other proteins for cryo-EM. Um, and we got to see endogenous phospholipids that uncouple the gate from uh, the peripheral tension sensing helices and then interrupt that tension transmission route. Uh, so linking it back to the inactivated state. Um, and this is again a novel lipid mediated mechanism of channel inactivation. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, thank my advisors, uh, Dr. Sergei Sukarev and Dr. Doreen Mathies. Um, NIEHS did the CryoEM data collection and University of Maryland Baltimore did the mass spec. And my funding sources are NSF and NICHD. And with that, I'd be happy to take questions. <laughs> yeah. What is the role of material to the ownership of an active state by those bacteria in that? That's a great question. Yeah, so the inactivated state is really, really important for maintaining the osmolites uh, during non lytic shocks, right? So if you're um, the inactivation has been linked to uh, osmotic viability very closely. So if you have a non-inactivating mutant of this channel, the osmotic viability is, uh, of the bacteria as a whole is greatly reduced because it's basically doesn't, the membrane doesn't reseal after shock. Um, so you are losing all of those osmolites over time. Yes. Yeah, so it's from the patch clamp data. Basically, we can't, there's no pathway to recovery under sustained tension. Um, there has to be a reduction in tension to transition back to the closed state before it can then reopen. Questions? All right. I'll let you guys go have coffee. Thank you. <laughs>